Lighthouse, the mandatory training for higher degree supervision at Charles Darwin University. Welcome to Lighthouse, your mandatory training for higher degree supervision at Charles Darwin University. And thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies and Professor of Cultural Studies at Charles Darwin University. It's my great pleasure to guide you through this Lighthouse session for your supervisory training. Now, I know... (laughs) Mandatory training is about as popular as Satan at a wedding. But this training is a national requirement for all supervisors. To rewrite that cliché involving horses and water, you can bring academics to mandatory training, but you can't make them think or indeed participate. So the structure we're using for this Lighthouse session is you engage with this session and you make it meaningful to you and you demonstrate the meaning that you gained from these sessions by writing answers to two reflexive questions. And you'll hear about those questions in the final section of this session, but more later. We have six sections in this Lighthouse Mandatory Training, and I've configured each of these sections so that you can listen to it when you have time available. They'll fit around you. Conversely, you can take me on a walk (laughs) with you one Sunday morning and you can listen to all six sessions in a row. My meta project through this session is clear. I want to move you from compliance to excellence. I want to move you from experience to expertise. And I want to move you from feelings about supervision to reflection on international best practice. We are in radically changing times for international doctoral supervision. Our personal experience of supervision, either as a student or a supervisor, is no longer sufficient to manage a series of changes. And let me tell you about those changes. The widening participation agenda, decolonising the doctorate, The age range of our PhD students, which at CDU currently spans from 23 to 77. The feminist critiques through Me Too, the Respect Now Always report, and the Student Safety Survey. The increased number of students completing a PhD without a scholarship. And the necessity to finish every student in three years. But the key is to gain information about the doctoral processes. And that's great, you've got the information. But I want you to reflect on that information as we move through this training session. You see, the goal is, together, we take this information for a walk. We make meaningful knowledge that you can apply to your supervision. Thank you so much for joining me. Let's begin. Lighthouse Section 1. Admissions. Our first section of this Lighthouse training is to probe some key andragogical questions in higher degrees. A PhD and Research Masters must have three parts. Admissions, Progression, Examination. And all of these parts have different requirements from a supervisor. So let's start with the key questions in admissions. When we admit a candidate to our program, how important is the candidate's ability? How important is the topic? And are there predictors of success and failure, completion and withdrawal in doctoral education? And perhaps most importantly, what is your role in the success and failure of your PhD candidates. Now, we all know students, maybe you were one of those students, but we all know students who passed with absent or poor supervision. But is that what you want for this university? Is that what you want for students? And, of course, is that what you want for yourself? 
The supervisory relationship is a key to the successful and quick completion of a doctorate. Indeed, 50 years of research reveals the difference between a student that finishes and one that does not is supervision. So therefore, let's start with some questions for you. How do you know, upon receiving an email or meeting a student face-to-face or via Zoom, if the student has the ability to complete the doctorate? What are the proxies that enable you to make that decision? What are you looking for? And what are the right attributes to look for? Similarly, what is a prospective doctoral candidate looking for? What are their proxies for successful supervision? And how important are publications, scholarly reputation and prior completions? So let's start with the admissions process. You may receive an email from a prospective student asking you to be their supervisor. That's brilliant. Okay, so what do you do? The first stage is a really simple one. Do you want a PhD or research master's student? And if you don't, please reply to the student. Please reply. Don't just delete the email. And then if you don't want that student as your student, then send that query to me and I'll work with our admissions colleagues to find a supervisor for that student. When we admit students into a higher degree, we take a risk. I'm not a time lord, although I certainly wish that I was, but if you're thinking of taking on students, the first thing to do is to ascertain their eligibility. So a 2A or first class honours, a research master's qualification, they are the easiest pathways into our program. But alternative pathways are increasing. It is important, even at these early stages, to get a sense of the whole person. Now, I took on a student with two B honours from the English system. So, in other words, it was an honours program finished in three years. And that PhD went on to become a book. He was, and is, an internationally famous musician. I assessed the portfolio of his career, and I let him in, and that was a correct decision. But it certainly was a risk. And there are ways to mitigate those risks. The key is to enact a skills assessment. Are they able to complete a PhD now? And if not, what are they going to need? Now, we use the phrase, particularly in Australia, we use the phrase research training a lot. I'm not a big fan of this phrase, but it holds international currency now. And one of the reasons that these training sessions exist and that they're mandatory in Australia is our students are required throughout the program to exhibit research training. And that research training is supplied by their supervisors. So if you're not clear about research training, then we are in trouble. But let's drill down into what research training means, and that'll help you, it'll help students, it'll help our colleagues and the university. But you may note that the phrase research training and how you consider that definition changes over time, it changes over our careers, and it also alters between disciplines. But let's focus on the core ideas. Okay, research training. So yes, methodology, ontology, epistemology. Can the student write? Can the student read? Have they got project management skills? Have they got information literacy skills? Now, if we can answer those questions, that's a pretty good start. So let's consider the admissions issue. It is important to balance social justice and opportunity with an open and honest discussion of the possibility of the student finishing that degree in the minimum time. But admissions to our program, well, it's just not simply about the student. It's about you. It's about the supervisor. A great doctoral candidate's project can be destroyed by poor supervision. Lives can be destroyed, money, time wasted. We have an incredible duty of care for these doctoral candidates. CDU operates, like most universities, a supervisory register. And yes, registers work at the compliance end of the spectrum to ensure that every single HDR student at CDU has a minimum standard of supervision. 
we enforce research activity in our supervisors. Five refereed articles must be completed in a five-year period. Now, yes, research activity is a proxy, probably an inelegant one, but a proxy for research ability. But it does mean that you have been verified time and time again by referees by scholars in the field. You've been verified as working at an appropriate standard. It shows that you are in command of academic protocols. But it also shows that you're active in your field. The characteristic of a PhD is that it makes an original contribution to knowledge. So how do you know that a contribution is original if you're not making those contributions yourself? Our students, let alone our quality assurance agencies, require an array of markers and indicators that we as supervisors remain scholarly learners, engaging with knowledge, being research active and continually improving our andragogy through professional development like this Lighthouse session. So the compliance elements of our policy are this Lighthouse supervisory training, entry into the supervisory register, yearly assessment of the register through research activity, you must hold a qualification to supervise it, and you must undertake a short professional development session each year termed our Touchstone Program. The Touchstone Program involves 10-minute sessions on a wide diversity of topics, so you choose a session that's appropriate to you, your discipline and your academic career, and you write 250 words in reflection. You must hold academic status of some kind. That is, you are an academic at CDU, including emeritus status. You hold an adjunct appointment with our university, with great respects to all our adjuncts. You must be available for the full candidature. You have the time to give the student, and you're not leaving the university. As a supervisor, therefore, you have very many responsibilities because you plan, you enable the resourcing of this project. You monitor research training and practice, ensuring compliance with the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research with its quite demanding new edition in 2018. You must be able to demonstrate strong communication skills with your student and co-supervisors, be available responsive and reflexive in your supervisory practice, monitor progress, teach the student as much as guide them, and yes, probably the most important job, select and recommend examiners. This is an incredible array of functions, but you do have the policies and the procedures to guide you. The key links are on the CDU website and you have outstanding Associate Dean's research in your faculties. You have me, you have our colleagues in graduate studies, some of the best staff I've ever worked with. You have our colleagues in ORI, the Office of Research and Innovation. You have our colleagues in student finance and our remarkable library and librarian colleagues. So use these resources, please. You are not alone. We are here to help. Because doctoral education is daunting. It is. But you have a network of support around you. Don't panic. You are cared for. Any questions, ask them. We have an array of duties of care for our doctoral candidates. And if we stuff up, we take their dreams away from them. We take their aspirations away from them. We take their futures away from them. And we damage their bank balance, their family and their friends if we stuff up. This is enormous. So therefore, this moment of admissions is marinated in responsibility and risk. But all these decisions and structures are required and we need to make some very important decisions at the very moment we are admitting a student into our program. But I also want to confirm that Charles Darwin University has a fully digital doctorate. Students can enrol in a higher degree and move from admissions to examination in a fully online form. Professional development is also 
fully online. We have a weekly online writing group called Write Club. You have one rule? (laughs) Right. That also is open to everybody and a lot of our colleagues from regional Australia and our international students join us every single week for Write Club. We have a weekly digital office hour session for any queries or questions or advice or commentary. So as you see, this is a fully immersive digital experience. These programs from graduate studies exist for all our candidates and they can be used from anywhere in the world. Therefore, in your decisions about admitting a student, we can support you, we can support that student throughout the CDU footprint, which of course now includes the world. Admissions is the start of an extraordinary moment for a student and a supervisor. We need to ensure that you know what we're looking for in a student and you are able to set that candidate up for success. And that is our next section in our Lighthouse training. Lighthouse Section 2, The Responsible Conduct of Research. At Charles Darwin University, we work on a backward mapping milestone system. We have three milestones during the three years of candidature, commencing with the confirmation of candidature in the first year. These milestones ensure that your doctoral candidate is working at both the standard of quality and speed that is required to finish with excellence, but also in the minimum time. It is clear, though, that a series of challenges and blockages emerge during that candidature, and many of these issues can be solved in the first few days, the first few weeks of their enrolment. The challenge is, if these issues are not addressed, the problems fester, and they can result in disastrous outcomes, not only for the student, but for you, the supervisor, and yes, the entire institution. The key question to guide you through this part is, who owns a student's work? Do you have the right to add your name to a PhD student's article? These questions matter. This is very, very serious. In December 2019, the NHMRC, the ARC and Universities Australia released a document titled Supervision, a guide supporting the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research. It is a powerful, freely available document and all the excuses are over. There's no courtesy authorship. There is no, this is the way it's always been done in my discipline, therefore you have to put my name on that article. All that's gone. These unjust practices are now in breach of the code. The guidelines are ruthlessly clear. Let me read item six to you. Quote, Examples of breaches of the code that are related to supervision include, but are not limited to, failure by a supervisor to provide adequate guidance or mentorship on the responsible conduct of research to researchers or researcher trainees under their supervision or demanding or accepting authorship of a research output on the basis of supervision, where the individual does not also satisfy the authorship criteria in the authorship guide. End of quote. Now I know, and you know, we've seen through our academic lives throughout the world some dreadful behaviour around academic authorship. I understand that. But Australia has powerful and strong guidelines. Just because you supervise, that has nothing to do with authorship. Nothing. You will have to prove your authorship by a set of criteria. It cannot be assumed courtesy authorship has gone. It is important that these discussions with the code, print it out, Talk about it with your students, that these discussions about the code emerge early in the candidature and that they must be handled with decency, transparency and respect. If any challenges emerge, and they may, 
then please allow me to join that discussion, facilitate that discussion, or any of our colleagues in the Office of Research and Innovation. It is important that these issues are talked about, talked through, and resolved early in the candidature. Remember that in the Australian system, the higher degree students own their own IP unless they sign it away. And those contracts need to be signed by the students early in the candidature. And if there are industry partnerships or alternative IP collaborations in place, these agreements must be clear. Without this contract or agreement, students own their IP. The other key deal breaker in research is, of course, ethics approval. Research cannot proceed without ethics approval and a lack of ethics approval can slow down the entire candidature, often by many months. So after authorship and intellectual property discussions, I would go straight to ethics and I would work hard with your student to get to that ethics approval as quickly as you can. So human ethics, interviews and surveys, animal welfare, biohazards. With these deal-breaker conversations now in place, let's move into that first year and that first milestone. Lighthouse Section 3. The Confirmation of Candidature and Milestones. A key moment of pressure and testing in the Australian higher degree structure is the confirmation of candidature. This is a deal-breaker moment. The student is assessed and the project is assessed. The COC can emerge at any point between 6 and 12 months of enrolment. This COC must emerge in this particular period as it sets the framework for a timely completion in three years. The cost of overtime candidatures is not only damaging for the sector in the country, but also for our students. And we'll ask a key question for the first time. What is a year of your life worth? It's important to log what may hamper timely completion of milestones and indeed timely completion of the thesis. These are professional judgments that come from you as a supervisor. If the candidate is lacking skills then swing in our professional development program as early as possible. So be aware of the milestones. Use them to plan each year of the candidature. At its most basic, use the milestones to backwardly map activities and progress through the year. At its most basic, remember the old cliche, begin with the end in mind. The end point is a timely completion and a successful examination, and that end point begins in the first year. Twenty years ago, scrutiny of supervisory processes was, at best, light touch, but regulation has increased in the last two decades, and to be frank, and I'm not against regulation, transparency and scrutiny, we need it. Universities are paid by the public purse, and we should be publicly accountable every single day. But also, we do have to ensure that our doctoral candidates are supported, that they're OK. Most of us who have been around universities long enough have seen some pretty dreadful, dreadful behaviour from supervisors, and often privacy and confidentiality are cloaks for abuse. So that is why the COC, the Mid-Candidature Review and the Final Thesis Review exists. What I ask is that instead of seeing all of this as an inconvenience, can we start to invert this discussion? Doctoral supervision is a privilege, it's not a right. It is a privilege to work with the next generation of students. It is important to share best practice, to be transparent in the candidate's progress and also log any challenges. This is important, and this is where we do need to have a conversation about the relationship between compliance and excellence. This milestone process may seem like a ticker box exercise. If it's treated like that, it's absolutely useless. What we need is robust and clear commentary about what is working and what is not, and we need that as early as possible. 
Successful supervisory relationships express the assumptions and negotiate a series of rules and expectations that both parties are happy with. The dream, and I will be asking you to complete this as a piece of written work at the end of the Lighthouse session, is to write your supervisory philosophy. I would like you to get to the point where you share this supervisory philosophy with your own doctoral candidates. You print it out and explain to them why you are doing this. But the key is, you need to know why you're doing it first. Now we're going to get to the crunchy stuff and we're back to that continuum of compliance through excellence. Increasingly, a pro forma is being used as a log for every PhD student meeting. So this pro forma includes date, supervisor's presence, student, what was discussed at the meeting, work submitted, topics discussed, work to be completed by the next meeting. Such a meeting record has value because it protects the supervisor in particular, What I would recommend is that you use your Microsoft calendar, log all meetings with students, and I see my students weekly, so my meetings are set for the year. But find a way to provide a record of what is conducted in those meetings. Now, I, for many of my students, use an unusual method. I use a sonic record through a podcast that logs the meeting but a few notes to ensure that students and supervisors agree about what has been discussed in those meetings and what is to be achieved before the next one is certainly of value, particularly if your associate supervisors are not present. Similarly, we have a responsibility. Again, this is at the compliance and quality assurance end of our discussion, to ensure that CDU is fulfilling the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research. The key tenants here are ensuring that we have a safe and ethical environment, our students are supervised well, and we comply with legislation, with guidelines and policy. We must enact full and transparent clarity with commercial and contractual arrangements. We place attention on record-keeping and data retention. We monitor the research conduct of our students, and we deal with issues in a careful, compassionate and clear fashion. All of us are responsible as academics and supervisors to make sure that we reach those standards. Probably the greatest challenge when we're trying to think about the relationship between compliance and excellence in doctoral education is record keeping. When academics hear a phrase like record keeping, we always think forms. Oh no, more forms. (laughs) And we think monitoring. We just want to be left alone with our students because we're fine. Now, I understand that ideology, but those days are gone. We're in the era of Me Too and Respect Now Always. We need to be really clear in differentiating a professional supervisory relationship and never, ever blurring into personal matters. But record keeping and data retention do matter. So find ways to automate as much of your record keeping as possible, digitise as much as you can. You will need records to demonstrate your supervisory practice. If I get a student in my office and that student says, I never saw my supervisor, and you have the records of all the meetings and what happened in them, then you've just protected yourself. A few years ago, I had a student in my office who stated that her supervisor never read drafts. He never read my drafts. So I contacted the supervisor, and within about 90 seconds, the supervisor had sent me 10 dated drafts, all with track changes of the dates that he conducted that drafting, and those 10 drafts had been completed in the last four weeks. 10 drafts dated four weeks. So I brought the student back in, and I'd printed out the documents, the dated drafts, And I said to her, what's happening here? What's happening here? Here are the dated drafts. You said there's been no drafting. And through the discussion, it became clear that the student had lied or indeed accidentally forgotten about those drafts because she didn't want to make the changes. But then with a little bit more discussion, it became clear that she didn't have the ability 
to make the changes because she was not prepared to do the work. That supervisor would have been so vulnerable to those charges of not offering feedback if he didn't have the tracked changes and the dated drafts. So use digitisation, digital signatures, digital forms, digital calendars as much as possible. Australia also has the Australian Research Data Commons, the ARDC, and the Australian National Data Service, ANDS, ANS. And they both support the access to research data held in universities and publicly funded research agencies. This is so incredibly valuable as it increases the access to research data that in years is going to allow so many of us to do an array of meta-analyses. Fabulous resources they are. Remember to use the resources at CDU that are available to you. It takes an entire university to complete a PhD student. You are not a sole supervisor flying alone. Our ORI colleagues provide advice on funding, grants, contracts, alongside compliance reporting and ethics. So let's now finish off to think about you as a supervisor, your doctoral candidates and the research that they're going to create. Supervisory models are increasingly describing PhD candidates as trainee researchers. There's a lot of compliance in that trainee model. We have to ensure that they comply with policy and practices. We must comply with milestones. We must ensure that their data sets, that their methodologies are valid. But the excellence, the excellence in supervision emerges through the relationship. Three years is a long time. Lives change in three years. And supervision remains a dance between student and supervisor. It is important to keep that dance in time and together as the rhythms change. Make sure you have the strategies for resolving conflicts, managing tragedies and negotiating challenges. Act early. Take advice. Most importantly, we are modelling research integrity. The reason compliance is so important in doctoral education is that the costs of falsification, fabrication and plagiarism are so great. And I also want to make a point about communication between supervisors and students. I've seen emails from students to supervisors and from supervisors to students that would make you wail like a banshee would make you shake your head or immediately resign from a university in abject shame. Don't hide behind screens. If you wouldn't say it to their face, don't type it. Similarly, if our students start sending really weird stuff to us or others, quietly take them aside and explain intellectual generosity to them. Also explain that supervisors are people. I think our students sometimes think we're gods or gurus or not quite human. Remind them that we too are made of flesh and blood and bone. To solve a problem, we have to name a problem. And I understand that many supervisors do not want to admit weakness, do not want to admit problems. Now, the problem is, if you don't do that, we will lose the candidate. You see, someone like me, a Dean of Graduate Studies, we see all the problem cases. And colleagues, I need as much information as early as possible to help you and help our students. This is not about disrespecting supervisors. In fact, it's the exact opposite. This is about all of us working together for the best interests of those PhD students and this university. So it is important to be clear when you're reviewing the candidate during the milestones. Be honest, please. Log any challenges. And then a plan can be put in place to help you and help that student. There is nothing weirder (laughs) for those of us who are in a position such as mine. And we have a crying student in the office about to leave the program, and we go to milestone documents, we go to annual reviews of progress, we go to those forms... And everything supposedly has been great for two years. So if we treat these forms as a ticker box exercise, we will lose doctoral candidates. 
if we treat them as a robust and transparent opportunity to log progress, our students and supervisory processes will be incredibly successful. So we have to name a problem to solve it. And so on these milestones, review the progress from the previous year, plan the next year's progress and present the challenges. The goal is a timely completion. The definition of this is variable, but it is two years for Masters by Research, that's clear. In doctoral education, the scholarship is for three years, with an application for a further six months. For me, I believe in a three-year completion. That is my aim as a supervisor, and the funding models for students and the university encourage that. The cost of overtime candidatures is not only damaging for the sector and the country, but for our students. Let's return to that question that started this section. Ask yourself, what's a year of your life worth? It is important to log what may hamper timely completions of milestones and the thesis. And these are professional judgments that come from you come from you as a supervisor, you as a researcher. If the candidate is lacking skills, then get that PD program in as early as possible. We have a remarkable library at CDU. We have astonishing and engaged librarians. So verify your skills, verify your candidates' information literacy and information management ability. Reading capability and writing ability are so important. You see, the characteristic of the students who don't do well in an examination is that their research and their reading level was pitched too low. So we need to get them to high-level refereed scholarship as quickly as possible. Writing improvements are also pivotal over the candidature. These are often much more gradual and incremental. Therefore, let's be aware of the milestones and use them to plan each year of each candidature. At its most basic, use the milestones to backwardly map activities and backwardly map progress through the year. If a candidature is not going well, And we certainly hope that the situation never emerges. But when things are not going well, the student may receive a show cause letter. A supervisor or associate dean research or even me as dean, we can request this letter. It asks that a student must explain why they should be allowed to continue. Now, there are many reasons that such a letter is sent. They're very serious. Sometimes it becomes really clear that the candidate cannot reach the level required of a PhD, but also other things happen, like a student simply disappears. They miss meetings, they don't read, they don't write. Therefore, it is andragogically sound if they are underperforming to ask them to explain if they should be allowed to continue and how their behaviour will change. The question for us as supervisors is how we intervene to stop that situation reaching that point. And the answer is a clear discussion of expectations in the first meeting. Regular meetings, I meet with my students weekly. Expectations of written work. Continual discussion of reading with particular attention to the level of difficulty, ensuring that our students are reading material that is at standard There are other trigger points in a candidature, moments that determine if a candidate will stay or leave the program. And so let me give you some facts. The longer the candidature, the less likely the student is to finish. The more frequent the supervisory meetings, the more likely the student is to finish. The more frequent the supervisory meetings, the faster the completion. The characteristics of students that do not complete, well, those characteristics are stark. They change supervisors, they suspend their candidature, that is, they take a leave of absence. I'm not saying that students should not change their supervisors if they are unhappy, but if they are to change supervisors, I recommend that it occurs early and we move through that change as quickly as possible. The question is how you're going to handle those difficulties. Let me present some scenarios that have happened to me. 
you've been supervising two students that are in a personal relationship, you're ahead of me, they break up in the final six months, how are you going to ensure they both finish in three years? A student suffers a divorce through a candidature. The partner of a student is suffering a terminal illness. A candidate becomes pregnant in the first few weeks of the candidature and then delivers that baby at seven months, stillborn. A student comes out as gay, lesbian or trans during the candidature. And a really, really common one, students gain a job during the candidature and we must move or transition them from a full-time to a part-time candidate and make sure that they finish while in full-time work. Now, they are just a few pivot points. There are thousands of them. And your leadership, your resilience, your compassion, but also your intellectual and personal toughness will be questioned. This is where the supervisory rubber meets the road. In most candidatures of three years, something very serious will happen in someone's life. But their life will be made even worse if the doctorate drags out. You need to configure strategies to keep that thesis and keep that candidate on track. So often I've found that when bad stuff happens to a candidate, the thesis becomes a life raft, the light in a dark time. Helping them to finish in the minimum time provides something incredibly positive from a difficult situation. Our aim is to create a student culture without excuses and to provide one final example of that. My extraordinary student who became pregnant and then buried a stillborn baby after giving birth after seven months of that pregnancy, finished her PhD in three years and two months. She went on to have two beautiful children and is an outstanding academic today in an Australian university. Good supervision can change lives. It's never about ticking boxes and compliance. It's about excellence with compassion, excellence with integrity, and yes, excellence with respect. Lighthouse, Section 4, Examinations. We've talked about beginning with the end in mind. Well, the ending in a higher degree is examination. Examination is the crucial moment of the PhD, and when I supervise in my first meeting, I talk about examination and examiners. I make students read at least one successful PhD so they understand the genre, and I ask that we write down five great leaders in their fields, and then I ask them that they put that list of the five great leaders above the writing desk for the entirety of their candidature. And I do that so that they always remember the possible audiences for their work, that is, examiners. Examination is the moment of quality assurance for doctoral education. Examiners have particular requirements and characteristics, so they must be external to the university, they must be of international standing, an expert in their field, research active, hold the qualification that they are examining, they must be impartial. That means there must be no conflict of interest or bias. And yes, they must be available to examine. Now, I know there is a tendency to ask our candidates who they would like to examine them. Please don't do this. We'll ask our students at the point that they fill in the intention to submit form to list the examiners that they do not want. This is important and it must be respected. But the key decision that a supervisor must make, the key decision, is to select examiners. That is our most important task. We are much more experienced than our students. They don't know the requirements of examination. We do. We are supervisors and we know what is required. I spend months <laughs> digitally stalking examiners. I'm incredibly rigorous conservative and careful 
in the selection of examiners. I want the best in the world in their field, but I also want them to be experienced and not fickle and not weird. Let me explain. How do you know what is at standard for a doctoral thesis? Have a think about that now. How do you know when you read a student's doctoral thesis that it is at international standard, that it's ready to be examined? We have five tiers of assessment for higher degree examination at CDU. We have two examiners in the higher degrees and each of those examiners independently grants a result between one and five. Let's do the numbers, shall we? One, the degree to be awarded without further alteration to the thesis. Two, the degree to be awarded but only after the typographical and writing errors are corrected to the satisfaction of the university. Three, the degree to be awarded, but only after the substantive concerns, as well as the typographical and writing errors, are corrected to the satisfaction of the university. Four, the candidate must complete further work and resubmit the thesis for examination. And five, the degree should not be awarded. One, two and three are in the old money. No corrections, minor corrections or major corrections. The final stages of the examination from those three results are organised within the institution. Four is the revise and resubmit, so we have to go to examination once more. And five is, to be brutally frank, the fail the higher degree is not awarded. So the absolute priority of the supervision is to ensure that the thesis and research is over the line. That means a one, a two, or a three. And obviously, a great result is both examiners award that above the line number. Great. So if one examiner grants a one, two, three and the other grants a four or five, then that is termed a split decision. And a third examiner is required. And then they independently offer their assessment, and with those three data points, the institution then makes a judgment. But let's focus on you as a supervisor and your scholarly and professional judgment. Particularly if you've not examined many theses yourself, How do you know? How do you know that your student's thesis is above the line? The answer is, you've read a large number of successful theses, you are research active, and you're working at the very edge of high-quality scholarly standards yourself. But you see, refereeing is very different from examination. I've written now well over 250 refereed articles, but I only have one PhD. Therefore, do not think that peer-reviewed articles are a proxy for a successful examination. They are not. I have seen examiner after examiner locate errors in the peer-reviewed articles and therefore move the student to revise and resubmit. So have you got a sense of the location of the line of pass and fail on a PhD? Do you know what a passed PhD looks like? Do you know what a fail looks like? Okay, that's great. Now, do you know the line between what is a major correction and what is a minor correction? Do you know where that line is? Brilliant. Okay. Do you know where the line is between minor corrections and straight through without corrections? These are tough questions. Do you know what an examiner is looking for? Now, if you're a bit shaky on some of these questions, think about your doctoral candidates. (laughs) So when academics listen to their PhD students and their choices, then, okay, listen, but your professional judgment must dominate this discussion. Students have an opportunity to object to the people that they do not want to examine them, and that objection must be listened to, but please choose wisely. 
If you choose examiners badly or you submit an undercooked thesis, you will ruin somebody's life. (laughs) No pressure. So remember that once the examiner has been approached, there must be no communication at all between you as the supervisor, the student and the examiner. So once they have agreed and that name has been passed on to our colleagues in examination, all communication now ceases. We also have to be very clear about conflicts of interest. You cannot choose an examiner with whom you have written or gained a grant. You can't choose an examiner who you've worked with at the same institution or obviously had a personal relationship. And obviously, although colleagues do try this quite a lot, you cannot select your PhD supervisor or your former students as an examiner. In the Australian system, we are lucky in many ways because we can select from the best in the world. So please, you can select the best in the world. Don't pick someone from Queensland. (laughs) Don't pick someone from Australia. Really, you can choose anyone in the world and you decide to pick an examiner from Queensland. Now, by the way, some of my best friends are Queenslanders, but you know what I'm saying. So please choose your examiners wisely. They have eight weeks to report and recommend a result. And once those glowing reports are returned to the university, there are some final steps. Most reports recommend minor or major corrections. Please don't be disappointed about that. That's absolutely normal. Get those corrections organised as quickly as you can. And what I do is I sit with the student and we list the corrections with precision. And then we address them. So what we do is at this stage when the student is obviously quite tired and perhaps a bit emotional, we give them clear and concise information about what to do, what addressing those corrections looks like. Now, my goal is to process those corrections at speed. Do not let the students sit and fester. Give them a week to calm their emotions and think about it, but then, wow, bang, get in there, make those corrections. Okay, we now have the final copy. At that point, the student is eligible to graduate, and they have a right to celebrate, and so do you. As I always say, doctoral supervision is a privilege, it's not a right. And we are building a future for our universities. We're building a future for knowledge, one candidate at a time. Therefore, the final section of this Lighthouse program explores the supervisory relationship. So we've worked through admissions, progressions and examination. That's the process. That's compliance. Now, let's activate excellence. Lighthouse Section 5, moving from compliance to best practice. This section of our Lighthouse training session moves us from compliance in the doctoral supervisory space, you know, that white-knuckle right hanging on to regulations, hanging on to policies, and it moves us to excellence, creating a research culture of excellence, achievement, passion and aspiration. We'll be working particularly on the characteristics of a great supervisory relationship. Right now at CDU, most of our higher degree students are PhD students. A small slice is a master's by research, and that is a declining arc, a declining enrolment. But we have international students, students living outside of the Northern Territory, and indeed Australia. We have part-time students. So doctoral education is everything to a university. I've said it far too often probably, but if Australian universities get doctoral education wrong, if we dumb this thing down, then we really should close up shop because the PhD is the qualification of the university. They are that important. But they're also important for funding, and this is the significant bit. All the funding we receive from the government comes via completions. So what that means is student load is not funded. So the university is subsidising the student throughout the entirety of the enrolment. Only the completions are funded. And that is why I worry when supervisors don't focus on the completion and particularly completion in the minimum time. 
it is dreadful for the student to have year after year after year of enrolment, but it's also dreadful for the university. You see, anyone can supervise, but not many can supervise to completion. And even fewer can supervise to completion in the minimum time. And that's our aspiration. That is excellence. Supervision is easy. It's great to have a cup of coffee with your candidate and have a chat with an intelligent person. But supervision to completion is hard. And it is important to remember that difference. And these statements are coming from a woman who's had to far too often pick up the pieces in our universities when I've worked around the world where someone is supposedly supervised or not. And the student is nowhere near completion, nowhere near an examinable standard. And I have to find a few thousand hours in a very, very short period of time to basically squeeze three years of supervision into six months. I lose weekends. I do all-nighters. I have to work the student to the bone because a supervisor did not focus on the completion. But completions also matter to you and your career. Promotions require a commitment and a success in doctoral education. And every university in the world (laughs) wants to hire a successful doctoral supervisor who can deliver results in the minimum time. Also, if if the supervisor can attract students, that's great, brilliant, but they need to complete. Also, internationally, there is an increasing emphasis on research training, so completing students in the minimum time while also ensuring that they gain research training and an array of skills. So this is tough. So let's talk about you, and let's talk about supervisory models. One of my big issues that makes me a bit crazy is the assumption that experience of supervision as a doctoral candidate leads to expertise in supervision. Early career supervisors and some well-dodgy late career supervisors as well endlessly return to their experience of supervision. And sentences that begin with, when I did my PhD, never end well. Where else in your research life would you generalise from a data point of one? Now, I had a dreadful supervisor and that was a blessing because I couldn't replicate that strategy or andragogy. Therefore, take a moment now and think about deeply your experience of supervision as a student. What went well, what went badly, and then park it. Move beyond it. Realise that it is a different time and expectations of research, supervisory training, compliance, quality assurance, international education have all transformed. Most PhD students now are not on scholarship. So how do you change your andragogy for part-time candidature? How do we increase the enrolment and success of Indigenous students while decolonising the doctorate? How do we supervise a 24-year-old woman in comparison to a 77-year-old man? How do we manage, how do we critique ageism in our universities? 20% of the Australian population has a disability. Only 5% of PhD students have a disability. So how do we rectify that imbalance? And for trans students, how do we enable and support their candidature while recognising the transphobia in much of the rest of their lives? So that's just a taste of the thousands of questions we need to ask ourselves about doctoral education now. Therefore, we all have to think deeply about the characteristics of a successful supervisor. Do you have a supervisory model and where does that come from? And is that model appropriate for today, for the volatile time in higher education? It is important that we all think about why do we want to supervise? Why do you want to supervise? And remember my point, supervision is a privilege, it's not a right. 
And for me, the continuum of reasons why academics move into supervision is on a continuum, I think. So it moves from profound selfishness to profound intellectual generosity. So on one end, you're supervising because you get a lot out of it. Or you're supervising because you're giving back to higher education. Now, of course, very few people on are, are on either end there. So locate yourself on that continuum. It is important to ask yourself, why supervise? Now, on the selfish end, and there's a bit of danger, Will Robinson danger here, supervisors are using students to enable their own research. So let me play devil's advocate here. A supervisor thinks they can cruise through some easy publications on the back of a student's work. And I see this so often, please don't do this. Have the conversations with students about IP, authorship, ownership. Do not make assumptions that you have the right to add your name to an article. By Australian Research Guidelines, there are now very, very precise requirements to add your name to an article. So deploy the research code. And ask yourself, what sort of academic are you if you need to leverage the work of your students? I'm being provocative because I want to provoke you. You know, there's that old football chant, soccer chant. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Often at the referee. And I would really like you to think about who are you? Are you that supervisor that's interested in what you can get from your students? So be honest about that characteristic in yourself, if that's the case, and be as honest as you can with your students right at the start. Now, I've been pretty staunch here, but I cannot convey to you the horror stories that I've seen and heard in the last 20 years when students simply lost control of their own research and their own words because supervisors simply sucked up that research into their own CV. And a warning here, students are fighting back. They are reporting their supervisors for research integrity breaches and breaches in authorship around the world. This is happening, this is real, and it really does not end well for the supervisor who argues, this is the way it's always been, this is the way it's always been in my discipline. Firstly, you know, I know, this is not the way that it's always been. And secondly, we have a research code today, and all of us must live within that code. There are, of course, positive reasons to supervise. It's a joy to work with brilliant people, developing fresh ideas. It's exciting to be around clever, innovative people, and it can freshen up your research by example. Supervision is also a way to pay back higher education for the gifts that it's given us, sharing our expertise, our skills, our abilities with the next generation. This is the apprenticeship model. This is the mentorship model. Also, though, doctoral supervision and examination is a terrific way to build up local, national and international links. It is amazing how many long-term friendships I've made by sending an examination request to an international scholar, somebody I don't know at all. And then after the examination, we discover an array of interesting collaborations and build friendships. Brilliant. So make sure that your motivations for doctoral supervision are strong and sound. Supervision is tough. It occupies nights. It occupies weekends, reading chapters in and around the rest of your life. And that's why we should talk about workload. What is increasingly happening is that some areas of higher education have a booming number of postgraduates and other areas do not. So if you are interested in supervising, well, you've done the right thing here. You're commencing your supervisory training, and I thank you for that. But also talk with senior colleagues around the university. Express your desire to supervise and ensure, and this is important for the entire university, that every single person that sends an email or makes a phone call about supervision is handled with respect and care. If you can't supervise them, send that query to your associate dean research or send that query on to me. 
The prospective student deserves care, respect and time and our colleagues in the university who would like to supervise deserve that opportunity. Research excellence is built not on bullying and bluster but on kindness, compassion, decency, respect and authenticity. We have one last section of your training. Yes, your assignment. Lighthouse Section 6. Assignments. Colleagues, the final part of this Lighthouse training is your assignment. And this exists for many reasons. Obviously, we must prove to our regulators that you've completed this mandatory training and I read your work to confirm that you are eligible to be on the CDU supervisory register. But secondly, I do want you to take this content for a walk and position this content in relation to your professional and intellectual lives. We have two 500-word assignments for you to complete for me. Assignment one is as follows. A new student has just enrolled into a PhD with you as a supervisor. How will you organise the communication system between the supervisory team and the student? What challenges could you confront and how will you negotiate those professional boundaries? OK, that's assignment one, 500 words. Assignment two is... Write your supervisory philosophy. I look forward to reading 1,000 words from you on these topics. Now, I thank you for your time. I thank you for your expertise, your kindness, and yes, your intellectual generosity. Together, let's enable the best future for our doctoral candidates.